Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm um, Anthony Painter. I'm director of the RSA's Action and Research Centre, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here today to this very special event. Um, before we begin, can I ask you to turn your mobile phones to silent? Um, we're filming today and live streaming over the web, so a very big welcome um, to those of you joining us online, and a reminder that the hashtag is RSA Networks, hashtag RSA Networks, if you'd like to join the conversation on Twitter. Now, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to introduce our very special guest speaker this afternoon. Um, Anne-Marie Slaughter um, is the President and CEO of New America, a think and action tank, much like the actual research centre here at the RSA, um, dedicated to renewing uh, America in the digital age. Um, she's also a Professor Emerita of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University. From 2009 to 2011, she served as Director of Policy Planning for the United States Department of State, um, the first woman to hold that position. Um, upon leaving the State Department, she received the Secretary's Distinguished Service Award, um, as well as Meritorious Service Awards from USAID and the Supreme Allied Commander for Europe. Uh, Dr. Sauter has written or edited eight books, and in 2012, she published the article why Women Still Can't Have It All um, in the Atlantic, um, which quickly became the most read article in the history of the magazine um, and helped spawn a renewed national debate on the continued obstacles to genuine full um, equality. It had like 750,000 unique reads in about four days. Phenomenal. Um, her new book, um, The Chessboard and the Web, um, offers an insightful roadmap, a grand strategy to how we might contend with multifarious global challenges using the power of networks as well as traditional global power politics. It is reassuring, reassuringly multidisciplinary um, and timely given the current situation on both sides of the Atlantic and beyond, of course. Uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Anne-Marie Slaughter to the stage. Thank you. I should say that in doing some of the publicity for the chessboard and the web, a couple of people have said to me, this is quite a departure for you, isn't it? Uh, you know, you who write on wor women and work and family, and as if I've suddenly come up with the idea of writing a book on networks. And of course, for those of you who know my academic work, I've been writing about networks uh, since 1994. Uh, and this book is something I've wanted to write uh, for a long time. And it starts from a very simple proposition, which was that during the Cold War and when I studied uh, international relations, a major text was a book by Thomas Schelling uh, called The Strategy of Conflict. He published it in 1961. He later won a Nobel Prize. And essentially, the book said the United States and the Soviet Union are two superpowers. They have what looks like a zero-sum relationship. One wins, the other loses. But in fact, if we apply game theory, we see that you can look at their relationship in terms of a series of bargaining games. And the most obvious, which is not less bargaining than, than brinksmanship, is chicken, where you know the two states head at each other and one blinks. That's what the United States and China or the United States and North Korea are engaged in right now. And a second game is a coordination game where both states want the same thing, but we have, they have to coordinate on what it is they want. And the third is prisoner's dilemma, which is essentially how you get two states who each of which could follow a strategy that would allow them to win and the other to lose. But if they both follow that strategy, both will be worse, worse off. That book essentially set the frame for pretty much any foreign policy issue uh, our governments have faced. When I sat in the State Department, I used to sit there and think, even though in the State Department the word academic is a synonym for the word irrelevant, and you hear it multiple times a day, I would sit there and think, no, actually, I can tell you what frame you are operating in, and I can tell you where that came from. So that's the world of conflict, and it is still highly relevant. I mean, if we are looking at US-Russia relations or EU-Russia relations uh, or re relations with Iran or China, there are many elements still the, of conflict and Schelling's framework still apply. But we are also in the world of networks. And I emphasize also that this book is the chessboard and the web. You have to learn to think about both at the same time. But the world of networks, the most obvious is we are in a world of global terrorism 
that is, are not state actors. There are some state actors, but there are non-state actors who are organized in networks, obviously Al-Qaeda or ISIL or any of their offshoots, but also any kind of global crime, whether it's trafficking in arms or people or drugs, uh, intellectual piracy, those are global criminal networks. And global corporate networks. All of the li literature in management for the last 20 years has been about moving from hierarchy to network and global supply chains or webs of peer co-creators if you are in the uh, uh, management side. And then, of course, civic networks. I come out of the university. Our universities now have networks uh, where they, they exchange credentials and degrees with other universities around the world. Our civic organizations, if we think of something like Oxfam or any of the big eight NGOs, they all operate in networked ways. The proposition of this book is we know that we live in networks. That is not news. But we actually have no strategic way of thinking about how to design and manage networks for specific purposes. So when we, we talk, we have strategies of conflict. We do not have strategies of connection. And we need those strategies to be able to counter threats and build positive uh, tools to navigate the many networked problems that we face. So that's fairly abstract. Let me uh, bring it down to earth, and then let me talk a little bit about grand strategy uh, in the world of, of networks. And again, when we think about a network, we think, well, that's nodes and links. It's people being connected. I always laugh that uh, I think for many women, we think about the old boys network. We know there's this thing that is powerful. Uh, I think it, people may now also think about the old girls network. But it's people who are connected in ways that make things happen, but often are quite shadowy. How people are, who are connected, how they're connected, how those connections are managed are all things that we can map and then actually alter strategically. So we can create resilience networks. Networks, for instance, if you know that uh, Russia is invading Ukraine or you know any, any situation where you have relatively weak states on the border of powerful states, you can strengthen resilience by building a particular kind of network. Or again, and I'm in London, uh, in many ways the global epicenter of resilience, uh, you, in, you can uh, build uh, networks of re resilience to terrorist attacks to, to say, yes, this node is taken out, but all these other nodes are still there. So if we think about critical uh, infrastructure. Communications networks, very important. And again, in the humanitarian work, uh, a lot of organizations have spent a lot of time thinking about when there's a crisis, what does that network have to look like to make sure everyone is connected, but not every bit of information has to go to everyone, right? You need a, a strong center that is connected to everyone in a particular way, uh, in a, re a response network. Uh, or thinking about stabilization networks. So after the uh, wall came down after the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. The way the EU actually stabilized the former Soviet states uh, or the former members of the Warsaw Pact was to take all their government officials, their ministers, their legislators, their judges, and a good many civil society organizations as well, like the press, uh, and, and civic organizations, and create networks that connected those people to people in Western Europe and the United States, in networks that were not just one-time communications, but actually regular meetings of all the ministers, all the judges, all the legislators, uh, and others. So that's a, a kind of stabilization network. Or then you think about uh, task networks, networks that actually have to do something. Uh, and at the core of the book, I just I turn to uh, Stan McChrystal, who was a four-star general who ran U.S. special operations uh, fighting Al Qaeda in Iraq, and he wrote a book called Team of Teams, where he said, "There I was. I commanded the special operations. Our the U.S. Spe special forces are the most nimble part of the U.S. military, which is still something of an oxymoron." Uh, that he and he said we were fighting Al Qaeda in Iraq. They were an extraordinarily flexible, adaptable network. And we could not fight them until we radically changed our own form. And he describes how he took 
a, a hierarchy and turned it into a particular kind of network. Alternatively, you might want a particular kind of cooperation or innovation, and there are different kinds of network forms that work for either of those as well. And then finally, we often need scale networks. If you think, just think within Britain or within any, any country, where we have many small civic organizations working against poverty or working on housing issues or working on labor issues, or specific problems that are quite local. If you are in my business and you are getting money uh, from foundations, uh, what they want to show continually is impact and that requires scale. So how do you create a network that is small in size but large in scale? so that you actually keep the energy and value of many, many smaller distributed nodes. That's a good thing. You do not want to centralize everything. You lose innovation, competition, local energy, connections to local communities. But you do want to have the impact of something that a large centralized organization could have. So there are scale networks. Again, net some, some are what I call replication networks. So if you think maybe less known to you, but in the United States, you talk about TEDx. So TED is the, the uh, big conference of ideas, happens, happened most recently in Edinburgh or happens in, in uh, California every year. But TEDx, anybody can do that. There's a template for how to hold a mini TED conference, and anyone who follows that template can do it. In the United States, again, or here, Alcoholics Anonymous or anything like that is a replication network. You create the template and it replicates under certain uh, conditions. So that's a kind of scale network. Alternatively, you can have a network that, is high, that has a central secretariat, but again, allows and encourages tremendous diversity among the different nodes. Those are strategies of connection. They say that the problems we face are often a matter of who's connected to whom or who is not connected to whom. Disconnection is as big a problem as connection or misconnection, people who are very much connected to the wrong people or the wrong institutions. And this book offers you a set of strategies of connection. Let me just conclude by putting some of that together uh, and talking about a grand strategy. The last chapter in this book talks about uh, the big divide in the world being open versus closed, uh, something that Tony Blair has recently written about as well. I think uh, increasingly people are seeing that whereas in the 20th century there was a divide between democracies and communist countries or democracies and dictatorships, now the, the, function, the, the big divide in the world is much more between open societies and closed societies. And I offer a a uh, grand strategy of open society, uh, open government, uh, and open international order. Open society, not, I did not talk about tri trade and immigration, and we certainly can talk about trade and immigration. I was not thinking about that. I was thinking about open soci society in the way that after the, uh, the former Soviet uh, countries, for instance, became open societies, citizen participation and distributed power. Those two things are hallmarks of open society. Open government, that's transparent, accountable, participatory government. That's with the open government partnership, which was created. Uh, Britain was uh, one of the governments that created it with Brazil and the United States and a number of others in the Obama administration. Governments that sign on to the pact of open government are signing on to transparency, participation, uh, and accountability. And finally, an open international order. Uh, I've said it is time to actually adapt the post-1945 order to take account of the powers of today. We cannot seriously think that in, in 2045, we will be governed by the countries that won the war in 1945. At some point, that will collapse. The UN will simply become more and more irrelevant unless we, we adapt it. And we also need to open the international order to civic actors, to web actors, so that it isn't just chessboard states. It's also web actors. I'll conclude by saying when I wrote that final chapter, I thought the United States would be on the open side. <laughs> um, as I said, uh, I was in the government when the Open Government Partnership was created. Uh, certainly, 
uh, the governments, uh, again, both Republican and Democrat, uh, had been on the side of open government, open society, and an open international order. Right now, uh, my country is on the closed side. Uh, right now, if, if I, I do not think that President Trump has read this book, but I'm hoping at least his national security advisor will. But uh, you know, he is essentially saying no. We want, we, we do not believe in openness. We believe in walls. We believe in pursuing our national interest uh, in a transactional basis, but not a rule-based order. Uh, so I am now looking at this uh, strategy and thinking it's now in opposition. Uh, but it also says to me that those of us who believe in openness also do need to take account of the forces that are driving much, putting up walls, much more closed uh, countries, a resurgence of nationalism. And perhaps that's something we can talk about in the discussion. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, let's try not to just share our sad stories, but we might come <laughs> on to that a bit, a bit, a bit later. Um, we'll certainly come on to the open versus uh, closed conversation. But I, I just wanted to start off with the um, international relations and strategy element uh, to, to, to the book and just play it through a couple of live current situations, if you like. O obviously, one of the most you know, appalling tragedies and challenges to, to face the world at the moment is the, is the conflict within um, Syria, which interestingly can be viewed from a whole series of different prisms. You can view it as a proxy war of great powers. You can uh, view it as um, a response to a particular type of network, ISIS, that has some of the characteristics of resilience, task, and scale that you talk about. Um, and you can view it from a more sort of response for a demand for a more open form of government, uh, greater democratic voice um, in terms of the Syrian uh, resistance opposition. How would the, the grand strategy have applied differently when faced with an issue like Syria? What would have been done in the preparatory phase before the conflict even begun that was different? And how would the response have been different once obviously the tragedy started to unfold? Well, let, me, let, me, let us start before the crisis really begins, which is March, uh, in 20, March 2011, when first the, the Syrian opposition started demonstrating and demonstrated for six months without using force at all. But even bef that, that uh, event was part of the Arab Spring, and yes. the Arab Spring did not just happen uh, sort of accidentally, the networks of dissidents who, who rose up in Egypt, uh, first in, in uh, uh, Tunisia and then in Egypt and other countries, were actually quite connected. And I write about uh, the, in the national government, the, the non-governmental organization um, who, who worked very hard to bring those groups of dissidents together and teach them techniques of nonviolence, uh, techniques that were borrowed from Atpour, uh, the group that overturned uh, Milosevic ultimately in Serbia. So just as an example where, in fact, there was planning done, uh, what we needed were much wider and broader networks. Yes. In other words, we had networks that once uh, protests began, that traveled very quickly. Those protest networks are not governance networks. No. And so one of the things we would have done was to think much more about party building, for instance. And I remember Secretary Clinton went to Egypt after and said, you know, nobody in the Egyptian opposition had thought about governing, which yeah. became very clear once, once the, uh, we had an election. So that's somewhat beforehand. But th the most important thing, I think, would, was to see the Syrian crisis in both lenses. Yeah. So Sec uh, President Obama did look at it from a chessboard perspective. And he said, you know, Israel's OK. Saudi Arabia, Turkey, those are our, 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 our principal allies in the region. Iran, very involved. We're negotiating with Iran. We don't want to disrupt those negotiations, something I, I understand. What he did not do was to apply the web frame. So from the web frame, you'd have said, yes, here's the Syrian government, here are other governments. But you would have said, what's happening below the surface of the state? What happens with the groups who are actually taking to the streets? What will happen if we don't act? And you, uh, you could have predicted they would fight or flee. If they, fl if they fled, which is exactly what's happened, it didn't take a genius to figure out that many would come toward to Europe. 
Uh, and you could already see large numbers. By 2012, you could see large numbers fleeing within Syria and then beyond. You could see the ways that would destabilize the region and then neighboring regions. And for those who were going to fight, they were going to need support. And if we weren't going to give them support, who was going to give them support? It's astonishing that the United States actually relied on Qatar and Saudi Arabia to provide support. Well, Qatar and Saudi Arabia have very different views than the United States does or Western Europe or Europe does about who should be supported. So you could see, and indeed we even predicted, those of us who wanted more action, this is likely to lead to much more uh, violent extremism, much more radicalism. We, nobody predicted ISIL exactly, but you had Al Qaeda in Iraq just next door. So the point was, if you thought about the human dimension, it wasn't a humanitarian issue, it was a strategic issue. What happens to people, then they're connected to other people, they will uh, act in certain ways, we need to be thinking about how do you act at that level as well. So, so it's interesting, I mean, obviously there was um, a, a refusal really to apply responsibility to predict, which was yes. ob obviously established in the aftermath of the, the Balkan crises and was there as a sort of international ethical tool. Um, the strategic failure, um, it seem, seems to be, um, is one of refusing to use your great power in the service of building the types of networks that might have led to um, ameliorated outcomes, yes. if not yeah. different outcomes. Yeah. Yes, and, and here responsibility to protect is in, not in good odor at the moment, but as an international lawyer, uh, international law takes decades and centuries to build. So the human rights movement, you know, the Un Universal Declaration of Human Rights is signed in 1949. It doesn't become even a matter of U.S. foreign policy until Jimmy Carter in 1976. Uh, and then you still have decades of building courts and building accountability. We should have looked at the responsibility to protect and said, okay, in Kosovo, it actually worked, but it was illegal, mm -hmm. uh, it but it was legitimate. Uh, in Bosnia, it didn't. I mean, the, the UN safe areas obviously did not work. What did we learn from that? In Libya, it was the right instinct, but the execution was absolutely not right. And we, it, we went much further than responsibility to protect. We actually toppled the government, uh, and Lib we're still paying the price. I would have said, okay, this is now we try this again with safe zones, where what we're doing is signaling to Assad he, he can fight against the opposition. We're not going to come in and overturn him. We're not going to take sides. We are going to tell him he can't fight this way. Mm -hmm. He cannot fight with chemical weapons. Yes. He cannot fight with barrel bombs. He cannot fight by destroying his country in order to save his own power. That would have changed the political calculation he was making. Yes. And it, it's hard to know, but uh, certainly if we'd done that in 2012, Syria was still largely intact. And I think we could have gotten a political settlement. Interesting. And more, more, more generally, it seems that there, there is this, obviously, and, and you, you make this point um, consistently in the book, there is interplay between a sort of great power chessboard and, and networks and so on. I, I'm just looking at the sort of great power strategies of the, of the day. Um, and it's easy on one reading to see that um, as the use of networks to pursue great power goals. I mean, China and a new Silk Silk Road strategy, yes. which you talk about, clearly is using networks and links in you know, economic links across Asia, Africa, and so on to, to build their national uh, power. Russia, similarly. And obviously, Russia is using networks in different ways, as you've discovered last, last year in the US um, elections. And I'm sure there's more to come on, on, on that as well. Um, and, and the EU also. But when it it's boiled down, it's still a great power strategy mm. through other means. At what point does it start to flip, do you think, and, and, and a sort of you know, network-governed strategy starts challenging the great power assumptions on which international relations often has been, or always has been based, actually? No, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question, and, and you're right. Governments absolutely can use network strategies, and I, I point out that China has one, Canada has one, indeed the EU has one, although the EU strategy was rolled out the week after Brexit, and I think it's fair to say <laughs> people did not pay a lot of attention to it. Uh, and, and Russia is using networks of political parties. It's, it's really, for someone who came of age in the Cold War, it's like the common turn all over again, yeah, except yeah, yeah. Uh, here, here now it's, it uh, is Putinism rather than, than uh, communism. Um, I think the question is not in the form. Mm. 
but in the ultimate goal. So the kinds of networks I advocate building are both, they're, they're national interests, but they're really universal interests. In other words, I think that American power and a great deal of European power rests on the fact that we try, we do not always succeed, but we do try to stand for human beings, not just nations. That does not mean we throw away our national interests. That's crazy. You can't, and you, you're in a democracy. You have to, Secretary Clinton would always say, I have to be able to demonstrate to a, you know, an unemployed worker in Detroit why I'm spending money on an unemployed person in, in Ghana, right, or, or, or some other country. But we, so we don't throw away national interests, but fundamentally our goal is to stand for all human beings, for universal human rights, for universal prosperity. We think that's a world in which we will flourish, and we also think it's the right thing to do. Whereas, I would say China's goals, or Russia's goals, or Iran's goals, or Donald Trump's goals are much more about this nation triumphing over that nation. That, you know, we win when we're Americans, not we win when the world wins, when the, people, the, the, the peoples uh, of the world win. Uh, and so that's a question of what are the goals you use networks for rather than the form itself. Which, of course, brings us on to the moment. Yes. And we're in you know, a situation where the legitimacy of these goals, albeit you expressed them in sort of civil, legal, human rights terms, people are starting to question the, the openness or open uh, values. And we are starting to think about looking after our own first and so on. And that obviously plays out in the international dimension and will play out increasingly in the international dimension. Um, Article 50, of course, was triggered last week. That's an international dimension, which is this is being played out. Um, the Trump strategy and uh, views and the alliances he forms and breaks um, will, be, will be part of that. So never, um, for some considerable time at least, there hasn't been such tension mm. between openness and and, and the desire, the political, domestic, democratic desire, some, some would argue, many would argue, um, to pull away from, from some of that. How do we start to generate an interaction, a conversation between these two value sets in this political moment? Yes, and I've been thinking a great deal about this, obviously, uh, in the United States, uh, as I think many, many Britons have been. Uh, I do think, so if you heard me talk about open government, what did I say? I said open government is uh, transparent and accountable and participatory. And open society places a huge value on civic participation and distributed power. Now, you could well understand what's happened in Britain and in the United States as a function of insufficiently participatory government and insufficiently distributed power. So in the United States, a sense that government, the power centers are on the coast. They're Washington, New York, LA, San Francisco, Silicon Valley. That it is actually very hard to participate in our politics. And here I, I think our democracy is broken. It is impossible for a majority of people who support something like just basic gun control, not, not complete, but just there is no way to actually have that view enacted, right? Uh, if I want to run for office, it's impossible. Uh, it, it will take, you know, million, hundreds of millions of dollars. So the people who can run are a very small slice of people. The people who have power are a very small slice. So there, I look at my own country and I think, before we open to the world, we actually do need to do much more in, in terms of guaranteeing that our politics are open and participatory transparent and accountable. Uh, and so there, uh, I think the, you know, one way of understanding what's happened has been to say, you're open to the world, but you're open to the world in ways that are sharply advantaging some parts of your country and sharply disadvantaging others. And you're not really, that conversation, as you said, and that politics is not happening. Yeah, interesting. And I think, I think that's entirely right. I mean, pollsters will, will say that they, got, they call the EU referendum right, but they didn't. And the reason that they, they didn't is because they didn't spot the motivation of a million or so non-voters to suddenly turn up. Because mm -hmm. what a referendum does, of course, it means your, your vote counts in a way that it doesn't. And we have a first-past-the-post system. Yes, You've also yes. got the Electoral College, which <coughs> has, has, has some similarities. But suddenly they had, they had the opportunity to participate. And it seems, seems clear to me from that there was a desire 
desire to participate. But that comes at the end of a 20, 30, 40 year cycle of being voiceless. So of course you want to, um, you want to potentially participate in a way that, 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 that might be frustrated, uh, for example. But it, if anything, the situation's got worse, I think, and it's getting worse because what's happening in both the US and the UK is that there is this enormous democratic tension and antagonism and ever greater anger. How do we pull back from the brink of the, of the anger? On both sides. Um, yes, and right now, at least in the United States, the anger is feeding, uh, it's, it's, the anger on one side is feeding the anger on the other in a, in a very vicious circle. Uh, and people who are trying to stand uh, more in the center uh, are not being heard. Uh, and it, there are ways in which it, it does look a little like the 1930s in, in ways that certainly uh, concern me. My um, prescription, and it's not an overnight one, is that we need to work much more at the local and in the United States, the state level. Uh, I. When I travel the United States, I see cities in red states or blue states, uh, but, but cities or, or sort of smaller communities, anywhere between, say, 70,000 uh, up to, to 800,000 or a million, but more the smaller ones, where it is possible for people to, to still know each other, to, uh, to come together. And indeed, in the book, I write about the, the critical importance of cross-cutting networks. So I describe the two steel towns, Allentown, uh, Pennsylvania, and Youngstown, Ohio. Very similar, both Rust Belt towns now. Uh, when steel dried up, they were both in massive economic recession. But um, Allentown, Pennsylvania has come back, uh, has made itself a tech center, their startups, their, their economic life is coming back. Youngstown, Ohio, not at all, uh, really in desperate straits. And the difference is very interesting that the head of the one of the most important steel companies uh, in Allentown, Pennsylvania, was on the board of the Boy Scouts. And there also was the union leader and the school principal and other leaders in town. And th that cross-cutting set of networks actually meant it was possible for people to come together from different parts of town and say, what are we going to do? In Youngstown, uh, there's a book called Why the Garden Club Could Not Save Youngstown. So the, the Garden Club was an important civic uh, organization, but the people in the uh, Garden Club were the wives of the, steel, the, the, the top executives in the steel companies. And when the steel companies went under, they didn't have that civic capital, those networks that you, you must have. So my answer, but it's a, it's a longer term one, is we go back to smaller communities and we rebuild those networks uh, and we find ways uh, not to have referenda, uh, but, but to, uh, to, to allow people to express themselves in parties or in, in my country in movements uh, that cut across traditional political lines. So we're almost going back to the sort of 19th century method. I don't mean that pejoratively in the slightest. I think you know, there, there is something to be said for that, that construction of local affinity, yep. relational yes. networks, institutions that have openness. And then over time, you try and construct a different type of national politics right. around that. But we're talking of sort of 30, 40, 50 year strategy. Are we in it for the long haul? <laughs> well, I do think we're in it for the long haul. Partly also we... we um, we're not recognizing the larger context here, right? The larger context is the digital revolution. It is, an, it is a technological revolution that is every bit as dramatic as the invention of the steam engine uh, and, and later of, uh, of the first industrial age. And when you think about it, the industrial revolution starts roughly 1820 or so, uh, and it goes through to World War I, and then there's another wave of it. Well, we got Marx and Engels and revolution and yes. war. We got massive displacement. People left the villages and went to factories and offices. That created social upheaval. That created terrible uh, conditions that communism uh, uh, arose in response to. Um, it's a long time, right? Yes. I mean, it's somewhat, we are, we're very early in the digital revolution, and we're just beginning to see what artificial intelligence is going to mean for a whole nother round of jobs. So part of this is we have to be thinking about politics that can listen to people and, and stabilize and, 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 and create uh, 
uh, different kinds of, of networks for a very long bumpy period. Yeah, interesting. And then I, th I think it kind of then raises a question about what about national government or federal government in, 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 in the US? Because quite clearly there has to be some radical change there. And obviously you were in the State Department um, for, for some time. You saw the machinery government from the inside, as indeed as, um, as an academic from, from the outside. What has to change about the way that national government operates, either in terms of the machinery of government or in terms of the types of policies and institutions that it pursues? Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in, uh, in many ways, I think the we should be focusing intensively on the machinery of government. So let's go back to the more local level. Mm -hmm. In the United States, you're getting flatter government that is working with citizens rather than for citizens. So you have what we call, you know, you, lot, lots of data. Uh, data about traffic, data about pollution, data about who's in need, data about emergency services, lots and lots of data that allow citizens to actually participate in either creating the technology or working with government officials to solve problems. That's a much flatter vision of government. It's a much faster uh, vision of government. It's sort of the opposite of bureaucracy. As we, the bureaucracy is hierarchical, right? It's Weber. We have a, a deeply hierarchical uh, sort of set of structures. Everybody has the same job. Everybody has a title. When I was in the State Department, I spent six months being told, you can't meet with this person because the person was above me. Okay, I got that. I was an <laughs> assistant secretary, and God forbid I should meet with a deputy secretary. The building might have come down. Uh, but I was also told I couldn't meet with people because they were below me, because that would, would, would have undermined the dignity of my office and everybody who worked under me. Well, that can't be, right? So part of what we do need to think about is how you flatten government and how government and citizen groups uh, can actually work together. And again, it's much easier to do that at a lower level, and then you move it up uh, to, to a higher level. But I, I look at those massive buildings in Washington or here in Whitehall, and I think, you know, if I could, I mean, I wouldn't knock them down architecturally. Some have great merit, others less so, uh, at least in the United States. But what I would do is flatten the hierarchies within them and create much more nimble networks of government officials who could work, again, with, with private citizens. And presumably, yeah, presumably outside of officials yep, as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, great. There's a lot there. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to open it out to, to, the, um, to the audience. We'll, we'll take questions in yes. rounds of three, if, if possible. And I'm going to try and take a diverse range of questions as um, ever. So please be forthcoming with your... I'm going to give you a moment to... When I said diverse range, I meant some, <coughs> some women as well as men. I'm going to ask this gentleman here, this lady here, and this gentleman in the middle. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Heide Rida from Bain and Company. Um, somehow it seems that in recent years, the power of networks has been better leveraged by the negative or the destructive side than by the positive side with ISIS being the best example, the share of voice they get within the Muslim community or the Arab community is so out of sync with the, sh the market share they actually have uh, through the way they leverage that network, right? So my question is, what can be done to catalyze networks on the positive side? And let's stick, for example, with the ISIS example to bring together people that care about that topic in academ academia, corporate roles, governments, etc and catalyze and strengthen some of these networks in the short term to bring a counter narrative or, or, or a stronger answer against ISIS. Thank you. Great, thank you. Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, I would love to hear your solution and your future vision for how we make this more, you know, um, squished government and a, a easy communication with the public. Uh, wait for the uh, microphone there. Yeah, if that's there. Hello. Uh, very interesting talk. Thank you. I would like to bring it to the context of action research as well and to really practical, practical knowing of how uh, would uh, networks be leveraged within a, a world that, as you have very uh, well articulated, is moving to a place that wouldn't necessarily nurture those kinds of ways of being. 
um, what, what would I do within my role within an organization, or what would government practically do within the short term? Uh, because the impression I have is that it uh, could take many decades to, to, for the pendulum to move back again. Is, is there hope, I think is my question. <laughs> Please give us some hope. <laughs> All right, so let me start on, on uh, ISIL and negative networks. I think that's exactly right. And part of it is, again, many people, when you think of networks, you think of things in the shadows. Right? You, and, and certainly global criminal networks, terrorist networks, these are entities that couldn't operate out in the open. Indeed, there's a political scientist who said Al-Qaeda would, would have been much happier to be a hierarchy, but it was very vulnerable as a hierarchy. A network was the form that it could adopt that allowed it to, uh, to survive. Uh, but you're, you're right uh, that, that when I first started writing about networks, there were many in the criminal realm and fewer in, in the more positive realm. In ISIL, fighting ISIL or, or uh, any uh, uh, radical Islamist uh, network, uh, governments have tried to create counter networks and have done so successfully on the military side. I mean, again, we have managed to do that, but on the the social side, on the, on the political side, the problem has been that the networks that have tried to be created have been by governments and have been very clumsy. So the US State Department you know, tried tweeting and creating networks of people who would counter tweet to uh, radical messages. That's one where government actually isn't the right organizer of networks. The minute you do that, you taint th that network. What you need to be doing is supporting through foundations, through non-governmental organizations, uh, enormously within the Muslim communities uh, around the world, in other countries and, and also uh, here and, and in the United States, to develop their own counter networks, some of which will be counter religious networks, some of which will be, uh, and there are people who work in my organization, on a secular vision of, of how government can work uh, in Muslim majority countries. Uh, but we need to be supporting, it's, it's a little uh, a contradiction in terms, but creating the space and providing the resources for self-organized networks for people who want to fight uh, without doing this all through government. Uh, on the question of, of um, very concretely, and these two uh, questions are, are, are somewhat together. So the, United, the, the British government, I think, has started in the sense of the, the UK digital service is a leader in reinventing a lot of bureaucracies in, in, in a much flatter and more data concentrated way. So the US Digital Service, which I know better, but which, which uh, followed the British service, actually sends teams of technologists into various bureaucracies, takes a look at services, and figures out how to offer them far more cheaply, more, and in much more interaction with the people who are actually being served. That's a, you know, that's a, 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 I don't think it's decades, but it certainly takes years. It means recruiting different people into government. It means, but, but it is a place where actually um, cutting the size of government can be effective in the sense of on a smaller budget, the, the way you need to operate is much more technologically rather than sort of through layers of people providing uh, those services. Mm -hmm. And again, the place you, you start is at the local level and then the, you, you bring those practices uh, to, to the national level. Um, which, which goes to, to your point, the first thing you actually do is map the networks. I mean, I actually say in the conclusion uh, of this book that I was the dean of a public policy school. And so I take a school like LSE here, and we teach people how to write memos, good bureaucratic memos. <laughs> but actually, a network map is the new memo. I mean, what you, we actually should be doing is seeing who is connected to whom. And what you see, and I meant to say this earlier, we're all connected all the time. We're all connected through Facebook. We're all connected in various digital ways. What we are not is connected to people who are different than we are. So one of the first things that I would do is you figure out, and you can get network, you can map the network of the people in your organization or whatever the people, if you're working in a particular area, who's connected to whom and whom are, who are they not connected to. My grammar is suffering here. 
Um, the, but, but, and then figure out how do you change those connections? If you, and, and it really is a different way of seeing things, uh, but, but you can map it and you can change it and you can think strategically about how to connect different people. I'd love to do that exercise for every leading politician. Yes. And put them together and where, where the density of connection and influence is. Yep. Not just who the people they have to meet in, there in, in passing. Exactly. But ultimately, how, who are the most influential people that they come into contact right. with. I think some of them would be very surprised. Right. Well, and just think about any of your offices. There's the formal rules, and then there are the people who really exercise power. Right? And those people who exercise power are not necessarily the ones who have the titles. They're the people who are the most connected. They're the people who always know everything, and they're the people who know whom to talk to to make something happen. That's basically what you map. Great. OK, let's go for another round of uh, questions. I'm going to go with this gentleman here. I'm going to go with this lady here. And I'm going to go with this gentleman here. You mention open government in the sense that that's the best. Is it always the best? Aren't there times when government is best closed? Great. Great Thank you. Hi. Um, I would like to ask a question concerning the uh, United States, the uh, ranked choice vote, as well as the amendment uh, to possibly have the Bill of Rights being um, you applied only to individuals, not to corporations, in that movement in the United States. Okay, thank you. And then. Uh, Alec Robertson, fellow. Um, I'm interested in the, the, your comment on the financial networks, the global financial networks that seem to have power above the chessboard of politics. Okay. Good question. So on your first question, I think it's absolutely right that you need some closed. Indeed, uh, there are, there I think quite credible accounts of uh, the difficulties of cutting the deals that you need to cut uh, in the United States uh, in an era of much more radically uh, open government. Uh, and I do think, I mean, just think about it. There, as, as people who run organizations, if you try to run everything open all the time, you won't get anything done. So I should have uh, said that I don't think that there's any organization out there that's not a combination of some hierarchy and some network, some open, some closed, uh, and the question is to strike, strike that balance. So even something like Wikipedia, for instance, has a core hierarchy uh, in the center. Uh, I would say, though, that I, th I think the issue for our governments is being more open um, to citizen participation, not voice, but actual action. In other words, it's not, it's not making everything transparent. Some things do need to be more transparent, but a lot of it is, is making it possible for government and citizens to work together very quickly. But you're, you're quite right. Open is not always the answer. Uh, and then the question on, on ranked choice voting and a constitutional amendment um, uh, to uh, provide individual, essentially to overturn Citizens United, which said that, that corporations uh, uh, had individual rights. So ranked choice voting is critical to, re uh, to reforming American politics. And essentially, it would be a measure of parliamentary uh, democracy, uh, state by state, states and cities, uh, can choose so that you, you vote for your first choice and your second choice and your third choice, it, 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 it then creates much more support for moderate candidates rather than extreme candidates. Maine is the first state to have voted for ranked choice voting this time round. It is already under challenge. The, par the parties are very worried about it, um, but I'm a very strong supporter, and it can be done, to your second point, without a constitutional amendment, and I think that's the way we need to go. Right now, given how divided the United States is, the idea of a constitutional convention terrifies me. <laughs> I mean, I really, uh, it was hard enough for the first time, and there are many people who would like to change the Constitution in many different ways, so I would, uh, I, I'd prefer, I, I'd, I'd at some point like to see a Supreme Court strike down Citizens United, but in the meantime, uh, again, states can do a great deal around campaign finance reform, too, and, and we should work through the states. Um, the last question, wait a minute now. Financial networks. Financial networks, indeed. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, yes, financial networks. So this, here, here's an example of where I think 
the web approach needs to apply. So just take uh, secrecy networks, the uh, um, corporate ownership networks, where where the people are in ta uh, corporations are in tax havens, uh, or or even states like Delaware or still Switzerland, where it's very easy to disguise who owns what and hence where money flows through. Or if you think about Cyprus and Russian interests in Cyprus. Uh, and one, I've just written an article applying this network approach to say here are the, 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 here's the network we need to build so that you could see those networks. Um, in some ways, again, this, this is where if you think about the Committee of Central Bankers, uh, the network of uh, securities regulation, regulators, financial ministers, insurance regulators, all of those networks come together in something called the Financial Stability Forum. It would be better if, if, if people looked at global governance, if they didn't just look at the United Nations, but they, or the IMF, or the World Bank, but they looked at the maps of those networks, and they thought about when do they meet, and what do we, if you are a non-governmental organization or citizens group, how do we demand more transparency when those groups meet? Because uh, that's a case in which governments are, are ahead here, of citizens, and there's a tremendous amount of power flowing through those networks. Okay, um, final question for me, to finish off, we're running out of time, but um, reflecting on all that, that, that you said, um, and reflecting on the fact that the, the openness politics seems to be struggling at the moment, learning the lessons of what's happened in the last two or three years in particular, what does a new politics, new domestic politics of openness look like as we <laughs> go forward? I, well, we, we, were, we were talking before that this is the question uh, of the day, and I've been reading intensively. I'm a foreign policy person, but I was saying my response uh, to the Trump election was to cancel a lot of my European trips and spend, not this one, fortunately, but <laughs> uh, and to spend a lot more time uh, in the United States uh, trying to both read uh, and connect uh, to people that, uh, that I have not been connected to. And I, again, I do think it's got to be more bottom up. I think uh, it, it is, and we've seen this before, at least in the United States, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, the progressive movement in the United States, that came out of the heartland. That came yes. out of places like Minnesota yes. and Chicago uh, and heartland cities where people on the ground were saying we need to ameliorate workers' working conditions and we need to uh, uh, find ways, the social work movements. So uh, I do think uh, it may take a longer time at the national level, but it took us a number of decades to get here. Uh, and we should be thinking about what is the place where we can, the places where we can most easily connect people who are now disconnected and get them talking to each other and finding common interests uh, in ways that will not be uniform. I mean, you may disagree with somebody radically on one subject, but agree with them on another. Those are the building blocks or the networks upon which democracy rests. Well, that's a great note to end on. And Thank you very much for not cancelling your trip to London. Um, I think you can uh, see today exactly why you should all buy and read this book. It's absolutely fabulous and essential. Uh, and thank you very much for your thoughts and for spending an hour with us this afternoon. Thank you. I enjoyed it.